everyone. Uh, we're just going to wait a few more minutes and then we'll get started. Um, as we are waiting for more people to join in, um, if you don't don't mind muting your uh, line, it would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Hi, everyone. While we wait to get started, are you guys able to hear us clearly? Just let us know in the chat. Uh, now it's 7.05, so we're going to get started. Um, so good evening, everyone, and welcome. So thank you for joining us for today's um, webinar. Uh, my name is David Liu. I'm the chapter co-chair of CSHP Golden Horseshoe Chapter, and I work at Norfolk General Hospital. And here with me are my uh, chapter co-chair, Dr. Ha, our presenters for tonight, Dr. Amin and Joe. 
um, and our sponsors from Novartis who made this webinar possible. Uh, so today we are presenting two topics on heart failure. Uh, just a little housekeeping before we get started. So all participants will be muted, um, but if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question or chat box in the GoToWebinar control panel. And um, Gunther and I will be monitoring and bringing them up at the end of each presentation. And uh, throughout the presentation, there would there will be questions posed to the audience. The poll function of the GoToWebinar will be used, so a screen will pop up on which you can directly answer. And then this webinar will be recorded and then shared, I believe, tomorrow. Um, so now, without further ado, we will turn the time to the presenters. Um, so our first presenter today is Dr. Uh, Fazan Amin. He is a cardiologist and intensivist with a focus in advanced heart failure, uh, cardiac transplantation, and mechanical circulatory support. He completed his cardiology and critical care training at McMaster, followed by a fellowship in advanced heart failure and transportation at the University Health Network in Toronto. Uh, his research interests are temporary and durable mechanical circulatory support devices. Uh, Dr. Amin. The invitation, it's a pleasure to speak to all of you, and uh, I know I've uh, probably uh, worked with a number of you in the past, uh, so uh, hopefully in the next uh, 45 minutes or so, I'll try to give you a capsule summary of where we're at in 2020 with respect to um, drug therapy for heart failure. Uh, as you all get used to this new way of life uh, and while you're looking at yourself in the on the screen today uh, you'll also hopefully spend some time looking at the slides um, here are my disclosures uh, what I'm hoping to uh, relay through this uh, talk tonight is that um, as many of you already are uh, I'm sure aware uh, the heart failure drug uh, landscape is uh, very rapidly evolving uh, and uh, the growing evidence in the last sort of five years or so has been uh, just remarkable and uh, every year at every major uh, cardiology scientific meeting we are hearing of uh, sort of uh, major breakthroughs in in uh, in our ways to treat uh, these patients and I think it's a very uh, uh, relevant topic for all pharmacists uh, as uh, you know there's such a huge emphasis on drugs um, and uh, pharmaceutical therapies when it comes to uh, managing patients with heart failure uh, although I will touch briefly on heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, the focus for tonight is uh, uh, low EF heart failure. Uh, and as I know, uh, you're, I'm sure all of you are aware, these are two very distinct uh, entities and they uh, kind of represent two distinct treatment uh, pathways. Um, and uh, we still continue to lack any uh, really proven drug therapies with any strong benefits in the preserved EF population. Uh, hopefully that will uh, lend itself to some breakthroughs in the upcoming uh, few years with uh, newer drugs. Uh, there are lots of ongoing studies uh, for drugs and heart failure that will likely add more to our armamentarium uh, that we can use to treat these patients. And uh, I was asked to give a very brief uh, synopsis on COVID-19, uh, which these days, as we all know, gets the final word. Um, I'm sure I'm sure I don't need to tell you any of this, so I'll uh, kind of skim through this. Uh, the it's important for all of us to know that heart failure is a massive problem uh, for our system, for our patients, uh, for our country, and really uh, globally. Uh, heart failure is one of the top five reasons for inpatient hospitalization in Canada, and I'm sure you see this uh, at your own respective hospitals. Uh, that along with um, other coronary and respiratory illnesses, heart failure is really up there when it comes to uh, the reason why patients have to come into hospital. And when they are admitted, they tend to stay the longest out of uh, the other more commonly presenting problems. Uh, mortality of patients with heart failure is uh, very poor, uh, up to 50% at five years post-diagnosis, not very different than many chronic mm -hmm. cancers. Um, yet, uh, you know, many of us uh, that work in heart failure are left wondering why patients with heart failure are not really managed with the same level of urgency as those patients that are diagnosed with cancer. Um, obviously, there are many reasons for this, but uh, as suffice it to say, uh, you know, these patients don't do well in the long run and uh, certainly uh, deserve all of our uh, attention. 
uh, to make them better. Uh, we expect uh, can, a number of patients with heart failure and, uh, to grow uh, with time. Uh, and uh, of course, with a uh, growing number of heart failure patients and cost to the systems, uh, to our system will continue to grow uh, with uh, prolonged hospitalizations and other uh, healthcare um, resources. Once a patient is hospitalized, as most of you work in the hospital, um, you know the risk of rehospitalization for a patient with heart failure after the initial event is very high. Um, we know that heart failure is sort of um, a, a, a type of disease that has a fluctuating course. And uh, although we may see initially after the first presentation to hospital, many patients leave the hospital feeling a lot better and often will stay stable for a number of uh, months or years, uh, they, they will eventually have uh, further deteriorations and peaks and troughs uh, within their disease course and ultimately end up succumbing to their illness. Um, once a patient has been hospitalized, the likelihood of them being re-hospitalized within 30 days after their discharge is up to 25%. And within the first year, almost uh, half of patients that are hospitalized with heart failure will end up coming back to hospital, uh, which sort of is one of the instigating uh, sort of uh, reasons for these types of talks is so that we can all educate each other and learn from each other uh, and uh, sort of focus our efforts on the patients that we're looking after while they're hospitalized to ensure that they're leaving the hospital with the best possible uh, heart failure therapies. So, uh, you know, I think we're all starting to recognize that the most optimal timing to intervene and optimize uh, heart failure therapies is while the patient is already in front of us, uh, even if that's just in the hospital and not in the outpatient setting. Um, once the patient has been compensated, uh, we try our best now to take advantage of that window of opportunity to optimize their heart failure therapies so that uh, they can leave the hospital on uh, as many uh, guideline-based uh, 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 heart failure drug therapies and uh, their outpatient uh, physicians can then uh, uh, tweak them and uh, optimize them further uh, uh, over time so that we can uh, prevent before discharge for heart failure uh, patients. Uh, so when they first come in uh, and they're congested, we stabilize them with diure diuresis and take advantage of the in-hospital phase uh, to um, uh, optimize them on um, survival benefiting um, drugs and then transition them to uh, discharge and then continue up titration as an outpatient. Uh, to start off briefly with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, so again, these are patients um, that have ejection fractions by most definitions of over 40% uh, in clinical practice, usually over 50% of uh, an ejection fraction. Uh, almost every trial essentially that has been conducted to date uh, in these patients has failed to find an effective uh, medical uh, therapy uh, to improve survival. Um, as some of you may know, uh, Secubitril valsartan was studied and published in the Paragon Heart Failure uh, Study in Patients with Preserved Ejection Fraction. To review this as one of the goals for today's talk is to um, uh, kind of, uh, this trial was essentially the paradigm study in preserved EF patients uh, for simplicity's sake. Uh, these were all outpatients with uh, preserved ejection fraction uh, of uh, over 45% uh, randomized to either secubitril valsartan or valsartan alone um, uh, uh, versus um, uh, uh, an ACE inhibitor 
uh, and um, they were followed uh, as an uh, outpatient. And um, these were, uh, the goal of this study was to evaluate uh, the efficacy of, um, of Entresto uh, in the composite endpoint of cardiovascular death and uh, recurrent uh, hospitalization for heart failure, similar to other heart failure trials and their outcomes. Uh, the patients that were included in this trial um, were essentially very similar to the patients that we're used to seeing in our clinics and in our inpatient uh, uh, on our inpatient wards, uh, which are uh, more elderly, sort of over 70 years of age on average. Half of them were female, half were male. They represented a variety of um, background ethnicities. Most tended to be hypertensive at baseline and many had uh, existing renal dysfunction, uh, elevated anti-pro BNPs, uh, and uh, significant uh, heart failure symptoms. Uh, many had the usual degree of uh, comorbidities that come with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, including hypertension, diabetes, and atrial fibrillation, and they were all treated with other antihypertensive drugs and diuretics as needed. What this study found uh, was that uh, overall, uh, there was a 13% uh, relative risk reduction in the composite primary endpoint. However, based on the uh, sample size and the overall sample calculation, uh, they uh, very uh, uh, closely missed uh, proving statistical significance uh, with respect to uh, patients when interest, treated with Entresto versus those treated with Valsartan alone. Um, so overall, uh, you know, the primary endpoint was neutral and statistically not significant. Uh, when the uh, outcomes were broken down, uh, so as I said, it was a composite endpoint. So when you looked at each uh, endpoints uh, individually, uh, the uh, heart failure hospitalizations, again, um, were almost significant but not and there was uh, again no no significant difference between uh, cardiovascular death uh, between the two arms so um, overall it was a neutral uh, study which again failed to prove that uh, another drug was significantly beneficial for patients with uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Some of their secondary endpoints to highlight uh, did include an improvement in the patient's um, uh, uh, quality, uh, reported quality of life uh, in those patients that were in the Secubitril Valsartan group. Um, they were more likely to have improvement in their symptoms. So as you see here by this graph, there was um, an odds ratio of about a 45% more likely improvement in symptoms compared to Valsartan alone with those with Entresto. Uh, but uh, these were all sort of secondary endpoints and from a, uh, a st statistical standpoint, uh, it's difficult to put a lot of weight in these outcomes alone to uh, guide practice. Um, some interesting observations uh, that some of you may have already heard about were that in some of the pre-specified uh, secondary analyses, there seemed to be a discrimination and a differential effect of uh, secubitril valsartan in uh, uh, in, in uh, males versus uh, females, uh, as well as uh, those individuals uh, that had a um, lower ejection fraction. Although they were all above 45%, those that were uh, between 45 and 57% seemed to have a slightly better effect of uh, Entresto than those that were higher than an ejection fraction of 57%. And these were interesting observations and led to further hypotheses that are now being looked at in more detail. Um, this was, uh, they, there were secondary analyses done on the gender and LV ejection fraction sort of interaction uh, with Entresto. And again, uh, females tended to do, have a better um, uh, uh, outcome uh, or better effect, I should say, with uh, Entresto and those with uh, lower, uh, those with ejection fraction on the lower end of normal or lower end of preserved uh, tended to do better than those uh, that were uh, higher uh, ejection fractions. But overall, uh, this study concluded that uh, uh, in, 
intracubital valve sartan or intresto uh, missed its primary endpoint, albeit narrowly, uh, with an overall uh, reduction in the composite of total heart failure hospitalizations and cardiovascular death by 13%. However, statistically not significant, uh, and uh, there seemed to be a potential benefit uh, in uh, women and in patients below the uh, below an ejection fraction of 57%. Um, overall, the safety profile was very similar to that in Paradigm, which I think is an important takeaway point from this trial that. Patients with preserved ejection fraction tolerated Intresto very well and no different than those with low ejection fraction. So it is a safe drug to prescribe. Um, and uh, overall, uh, you know, uh, this would, drug will require sort of further study before being, uh, uh, before we could change our practice in uh, universal prescription in patients with preserved EF. Uh, and again, to show you the safety profile, uh, you know, the hypotension tends to be the main side effect in uh, both low and preserved EF patients um, and uh, uh, renal dysfunction, uh, as well as potassium or hyperkalemia uh, patients tend to have more favorable outcomes with Entresto compared to those with uh, valsartan alone. Uh, we know from Paradigm about the higher risk of angioedema and that held true in this uh, trial as well. Um, that's sort of a quick word on uh, preserved EF patients. Uh, shifting gears to reduced ejection fraction patients. So these are patients with an ejection fraction in most studies less than 40%. Uh, and these are classically, you know, the patients that we've always um, endeavored to start on beta blockers um, and uh, classically ACE inhibitors and now uh, ARNIs. And now I'd like to, you know, I wanted to spend a little bit of time to uh, give you a further update on newer uh, drugs uh, that, that have come up and newer data that has come up in these patients. Um, this is a sort of, um, you know, uh, 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 it's, a, it's a pharmacist sort of um, a toolbox of uh, things to use here. And, uh, you know, it makes me very uh, kind of proud to know my drugs uh, relatively well as a cardiologist. Uh, and a heart failure doctor uh, when it comes to heart failure because uh, drugs are sort of the mainstay in uh, therapy uh, for this condition. And it's very sort of reassuring to see how much we can benefit our patients' uh, survival uh, and their well being uh, by ensuring that we're treating them with the right drugs at the right time. And this uh, was a study that looked at all the different gar um, guideline uh, proven medical therapies for. Uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, and what we what we find is that there is an incremental benefit of drug therapies in that the combination of an ACE inhibitor uh, and uh, a beta blocker and uh, sorry a combination of an RNA beta blocker and RNA and MRA has uh, a 62% um, improvement in their all-cause mortality and uh, a 64% improvement in their cardiovascular mortality, a significant improvement in their heart failure, uh, all cause and heart failure hospitalizations. And if we compare that to the relative benefit of each of the individual drugs, uh, we can see that uh, these drugs alone are not nearly as effective as they are in combination. So this is what drives a lot of our uh, guidelines in terms of ensuring that our patients with low ejection fraction are at w as many times as possible on uh, you know, triple therapy, uh, some doses of all three uh, drugs, if at all possible, at the best possible or best tolerated uh, doses. Um, and based on these studies, uh, the number needed to treat to improve uh, five-year uh, all-cause mortality is in the low double digits, uh, which is really phenomenal uh, data from a statistics standpoint. Uh, and uh, it really shows us how uh, you know, potent and, and helpful these drugs are in improving our patients' uh, survival. Uh, talking about SGLT2 inhibitors now, um, we know from the Empereg uh, study from a couple of years ago that uh, really brought SGLT2 uh, inhibitors uh, onto uh, you know uh, onto the playing field. Uh, 
uh, this study that was uh, published um, uh, in the fall of last year, DAPA HF, looking at um, NYGA functional class two patients with LV ejection fractions of less than 40%, randomized to uh, DAPA, DAPA, DAPA glifosin. I still have trouble saying that, uh, versus placebo, uh, including those that were diabetic and non-diabetic, looking at our usual heart failure driven uh, outcomes. And uh, most of these patients uh, were on the usual baseline therapies, including ACE inhibitors or ARNIs. Uh, many were on di uh, diuretics, and about um, half of them were diabetic, and the other half were non-diabetic. And um, as many of you may already know, uh, this trial found a significant uh, improvement in patients um, with respect to the co primary composite endpoint of cardiovascular death, heart failure, hospitalization, or a ha urgent heart failure e emergency room visit uh, with a relative risk reduction of 25% in diabetics. And most interestingly, perhaps uh, from this study that added to the Empereg study was that even in non-diabetics, the benefit held true with a relative risk reduction of 27% in the primary outcome with dapagliflozin compared to placebo. So uh, uh, by, uh, by, by sort of um, uh, no stretch of the uh, term, this was a groundbreaking uh, study in, in heart failure and will no doubt uh, change the way we practice our uh, prescribing patterns uh, with, when the new set of guidelines is released um, uh, later this year and in fact has already been reflected in the most recent guidelines that I'll show you. Uh, from a safety and adverse uh, effects standpoint, uh, we uh, the study found that uh, among uh, similar to the Empereg uh, study, uh, these drugs were pretty well tolerated. Uh, there is a, a somewhat uh, higher risk of euglycemic keto, uh, euglycemic diabetic ketoacidosis, um, and uh, there is a diuretic uh, effect. Uh, but uh, overall. Um, compared to placebo, uh, this drug was very well uh, tolerated. So overall, uh, this study found that when uh, DAPA was added to standard therapy, uh, it reduced the risk of worsening heart failure as well as cardiovascular death. It also improved symptoms in patients with low ejection fraction, and again, both with and without diabetes. Uh, so really a remarkable uh, drug when it comes to even non-diabetics uh, with heart failure and low EF. Uh, it was well tolerated and absolute risk and re relative risk reductions uh, were substantial uh, as well as both, both statistically and clinically uh, significant. Uh, so uh, in conclusion, this study uh, you know, uh, basically offers a new, uh, a new drug on the block when it comes to treating patients with uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction whether or not they're diabetic. Uh, there's lots more to come when it comes to SGLT2 inhibitors. You know, these things are coming at us like a freight train. Uh, uh, down in the next uh, sort of uh, one to two years, we'll see a number of studies uh, published uh, with SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, Emperor is ongoing uh, as there's an arm of that study that is looking at preserved ejection fraction. Uh, and uh, deliver as well will shed more light on uh, patients with preserved EF and whether this uh, drug offers any benefit in that population. Uh, but certainly, uh, again, going back to my um, my sort of uh, uh, kind of plug to pharmacists uh, that uh, this is sort of going to be our uh, wheelhouse uh, for years to come. Uh, Yet another new kit on the block is Verisiguat. Uh, Verisiguat, for those of you uh, that may have not uh, seen, uh, had a study published. Uh, the Victoria trial was published a couple of weeks ago uh, uh, and after being presented at the virtual ACC amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and yet again, uh, you know, even COVID couldn't stop heart failure uh, drugs from coming on the market. Uh, this is uh, a um, this is a, a, a solub soluble guanyl cyclase uh, um, sort of a stimulator that has been used in patients with uh, pulmonary hypertension in the past, uh, specifically related to uh, uh, 
chronic thromboembolic uh, disease and chronic thromboembolic uh, pulmonary hypertension uh, with a mechanism that is related uh, to increasing uh, nitric oxide uh, within uh, the circulation of patients with heart failure. Uh, because at, at baseline, heart failure and pulmonary hypertension are associated with pulmonary vasoconstriction and reduced level of nitric, re reduced levels of nitric oxide in circulation. So uh, biologically or physiologically, um, it would uh, make sense that if we help relax the pulmonary vasculature and increase the availability of nitric oxide, that that should offer some uh, physiologic benefit. That is what triggered the Victoria trial. It was an extremely difficult uh, trial to do over several years uh, and included patients uh, above the age of 18 uh, with an ejection fraction of less than 45% and also a prior uh, heart failure hospitalization within the prior uh, six months and a known objective elevated NT-pro BNP. And these patients were randomized to various ciguat on top of their standard heart failure therapy versus placebo. Um, I'll turn your attention to the graph on the left side, which shows you the primary outcome, uh, which um, revealed a relative risk reduction of 10% uh, compared to placebo. Uh, hazard ratio of 0 0.9 with very ciguat uh, compared to placebo for their primary outcome of a composite of uh, relative risk reduction in cardiac death and heart failure hospitalization. Uh, so again, a positive uh, study. Uh, and when we break down the primary composite into its individual components, there was uh, mostly a, a benefit being driven uh, by being driven by a reduction in heart failure hospitalizations with very ciguat and a non-significant um, impact on cardiac, mort uh, cardiac death or mortality. Um, the authors of this study uh, concluded at the ACC uh, that uh, certainly in patients at risk of uh, heart failure de uh, decompensation, so these are patients with low EF and uh, hospitalization or decompensation within the prior six months, adding verisiguat as a vasodilator to their baseline heart failure therapy does reduce the uh, chances of them returning to hospital again with a heart failure hospitalization. Uh, more to come on that, and I think this data will take a little bit of time to process uh, and also for the drug to go through its uh, usual regulatory patterns, uh, regulatory sort of uh, pathways uh, before we see it in clinical practice. Uh, but I imagine this drug will at some point uh, make, it, make its way into uh, our guidelines uh, at some point in the next um, you know, uh, year or two. Um, I wanted to sort of um, uh, bring to your attention uh, that the cardia Canadian Cardiovascular uh, Society did publish an updated uh, recommendation on management of heart failure patients uh, earlier this year uh, in February 2020. Uh, and our prior sort of um, uh, triple therapy uh, algorithm still holds, holds true uh, for low EF patients. However, I'd like to uh, turn to your attention with the SGLT2 data that uh, a number of recommendations have been either updated or added uh, with more, sp uh, more specifically uh, SGLT2 inhibitors uh, can be used in diabetics and those with other cardiac risk factors for atherosclerosis for the prevention uh, of, heart, uh, of heart failure, hospitalization and death. That's data from Empareg, uh, and a new uh, recommendation for the use of SGLT2 inhibitors in, age, in patients age in uh, diabetics over the age of 50 to reduce heart failure hospitalizations as a strong recommendation again. So, you know, this is a large uh, group of patients uh, that will need uh, knowledge translation uh, for uh, an increased uptake of these drugs. Uh, and then uh, another new recommendation uh, based on the DAPA study uh, for patients with an LVEF of less than 40% uh, and conco concomitant uh, type 2 diabetes to use SGLT2 inhibitors to reduce their likelihood of death and heart failure hospitalization. 
and again uh, EF less than 40 percent either with or without diabetes to improve symptoms and quality of life and to reduce the risk of heart failure hospitalization and cardiac death so um, important uh, additions to our armamentarium of drugs to treat uh, patients with uh, low EF uh, heart failure uh, and, uh, and, uh, and more to come. Uh, I'll try to finish up on time here uh, and I was asked to give a brief sort of update on COVID-19. Uh, you know, I'd be lying to t uh, if I told you that uh, I know about all these drugs in detail because I don't and I can tell you that uh, when I looked up the number of registered clinical trials on clinicaltrials.gov on uh, COVID right now, there are more than 800 studies uh, that have been registered. So, uh, you know, there, this is sort of a massive stimulus when it comes to a uh, worldwide uh, effort in trying to understand this disease better and to understand um, potential breakthroughs in therapeutics. Uh, but uh, as many of you know better than I do when it comes to these drugs, uh, I'm uh, just a cardiologist, so I don't know much about the HIV uh, drugs and some of these other uh, biologic agents, but certainly um, uh, a number of different drugs are currently being studied, uh, many of them on an international basis, many of them in North America, some of them are being led out of our own institution uh, at McMaster and uh, several collaborating uh, institutions uh, across Canada and uh, and around the world. Uh, for the time being, however, I think the main message uh, to Relay is that these drugs are only uh, being asked to uh, be used uh, in the setting of a clinical trial. Uh, and I'm sure your own hospitals probably have policies within your pharmacy um, uh, departments about uh, releasing these drugs and around which um, sort of uh, clauses and restrictions uh, that uh, are, are applicable. Uh, but uh, from a clinical standpoint, uh, you know, we're uh, um, doing our best to only use these drugs in the setting of uh, clinical trials before we have uh, further evidence uh, specifically for COVID patients. Um, so uh, to come back to our take-home messages uh, again, uh, you know, it's a, it's a good time to be a pharmacist, and it's a good time to be a heart uh, cardiac pharmacist. I imagine uh, it's a good time to be a heart failure doctor uh, because uh, there are many different uh, uh, treatment options, uh, and we didn't even talk about uh, sort of the non-pharmaceutical uh, treatment options uh, in terms of. Uh, device support and um, uh, on both the acute and chronic side, but specifically just when it comes to medications, uh, the landscape for heart failure drugs is rapidly evolving and will continue to rapidly evolve based on the ongoing studies and the sheer volume of uh, trials that are ongoing uh, in the next uh, few years. And I imagine as we've had more and more uh, new data come up at every major annual a cardiac meeting, I imagine that'll remain the pattern for the next upcoming uh, several years. Um, preserved EF and reduced EF uh, patients present two distinct uh, treatment pathways, and um, you know we're still struggling with the preserved EF. I think Paragon was a study that came close to proving benefit uh, with uh, ARNI in uh, preserved EF patients. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens with its um, uh, uh, approval process and the indications for uh, use, um, uh, but uh, for the time being, I think universal prescription in these patients um, cannot be recommended. Uh, we um, will have a lot more data with ongoing studies uh, as more and more drugs like SGLT2 inhibitors, like Verisigawatt, uh, uh, are, are added and perhaps even more data coming out on uh, Secubitril, Valsartan, and Arnie's in uh, uh, patients with renal disease, uh, patients with diabetes, uh, and uh, further sort of uh, the mid-range ejection fraction patients will really add uh, more and more to our toolbox when it comes to uh, treating our patients with heart failure. Uh, and uh, as we're all thinking about COVID-19 uh, from a drug standpoint, I think the important message is that uh, our treatment still remains supportive. Uh, first principles, 
and uh, use of um, one or more than uh, a more of a combination of certain drugs in the setting of ongoing clinical trials. Uh, so with that, I will um, uh, uh, wish you all the best and, uh, and the best of uh, safety for you and your families and be happy to take questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Amin. So I um, will take, uh, take some time to answer questions and just a reminder, please uh, type in your questions on the question or chat box on your GoToWebinar um, control panel. Um, so we have one question right now. So um, can you comment on how to manage goal-directed therapy for patients with recovered ejection fraction whose ejection fraction was previously less than 40%, but then the repeated one was greater than 50%. Should we de-prescribe or continue current goal-directed therapies? Uh, great question. Um, it's a challenging. Uh, it's a challenging question, uh, and it's um, uh, ultimately it's a case by case uh, clinical decision that we usually make in partnership with our patients. Um, I think the best evidence so far, uh, based on um, about a year or a year and a half old uh, study, uh, randomized study that looked at patients with uh, recovered ejection fraction. We know that withdrawal of uh, guideline-directed um, treatments does result in um, sort of a recurrence of or drop in EF in a significant proportion of these patients. Uh, so uh, my current uh, personal practice is to continue uh, guideline-directed practice, guideline-directed therapies in all patients. The, only patients where I would feel comfortable withdrawing therapy on a very gradual and graded, um, uh, in a very gradual and graded manner, are uh, patients that um, have a very transient drop in their LV function based on an acutely reversible trigger. For example, patients that have uh, tachycardia related cardiomyopathy in the setting of uh, new onset atrial fibrillation. Uh, and after restoration of sinus rhythm, uh, they have full recovery in their LV function. Uh, if they're on triple therapy, I will, uh, in some situations, uh, slowly withdraw one drug uh, uh, out of the three, and my preference is still to keep them on at least one or two out of the three medications. So I don't practice... Um, uh, my general approach is very conservative. I do not recommend withdrawing uh, drugs on uh, on most patients, uh, with very few exceptions uh, who we may withdraw some drugs on. I still uh, try not to withdraw all uh, all drugs. Thank you. Uh, so another question is. Um, how do you feel about trying to titrate doses to max tolerated or targeted doses before adding another agent um, versus adding another medication before pushing doses to of the current medications? Yeah, another great question. Um, my general approach and what most heart failure doctors that I've worked with uh, practice is to um, attempt to get at least moderate doses of all three uh, uh, guideline uh, directed drugs on board and then work on uh, uh, maximizing all of the three drugs. Uh, I'd rather personally have uh, patients on uh, you know, uh, uh, moderate doses of all three drugs than to only have them on max doses of one or two drugs, uh, especially if their LV ejection fraction is less than 40%. Uh, some of people, some people practice uh, differently than that. Some people will uh, stick with one medication at a time and until it's maximized, and then start the second, and then start the third. Uh, it's not the wrong thing to do uh, by any means, uh, but uh, I think more and more data, including the one that I kind of uh, showed you about the incremental benefit of all three drugs on top of each other being better than the sum of uh, each part uh, is is um, uh, sort of what drives uh, some of our practices, including mine, uh, in uh, doing our best to get um, you know uh, uh, some moderate doses of all three drugs. Thank you. Uh, this question, I think, was 
looping back to your uh, first question. Um, so um, when you're talking about withdrawing medications, which drug uh, would you withdraw? Um, yeah, great question. Uh, I think most of us would, would withdraw um, in a patient that has had their LV ejection fraction recover to over 55%, so being in a normal range, uh, we would uh, withdraw the MRA uh, first, and uh, most of us would prefer to leave them on uh, a combination of the ACE inhibitor and the beta blocker. Uh, in very, very few patients, I will uh, withdraw uh, the ACE inhibitor uh, very, very gradually, and by gradually, I mean over months as opposed to you know, over weeks, the way we up titrate them, we up titrate them over a course of a few weeks at a time. But, uh, you know, for uh, withdrawing them, I would uh, withdraw very small dose increments over a period of months and have routine surveillance, uh, clinical and echocardiographic assessments. Uh, but uh, my preference would be to just, uh, if I'm going to withdraw something, I would withdraw the MRA and uh, leave the ACE inhibitor, ACE inhibitor and beta blocker on. Great, thank you. And then um, another question. So there are many trials um, showing benefits of uh, heart failure re in reject reduced ejection fraction in terms of outcomes. So in a type two diabetic patient's resistant to taking medications, uh, which medication regimen would you generally generally recommend? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, I'm not sure I'm the best person to answer that. I'm not a diabetologist and I don't necessarily understand all the uh, evidence when it comes to the different antihyperglycemic medications and and its uh, impact on diabetic outcomes um, uh, kind of uh, precisely. Uh, but certainly when it comes to uh, heart failure and cardiac outcomes, uh, many of us would um, try to maintain them, maintain diabetics uh, on an SGLT2 inhibitor uh, along with um, uh, along with uh, metformin uh, and um, and sort of um, uh, uh, withdraw uh, the other classes of um, uh, diabetic uh, medications um, uh, in place of the SGLT2 inhibitor. Uh, but uh, I would usually not do this on my own. Uh, as a cardiologist, uh, I would uh, do it in conjunction with my uh, endocrinologist or family physician, uh, whoever the patient's diabetologist is. Thank you. And then just a few more questions. And then, so um, what are your thoughts on using uh, ARBs that, are, that have not been studied in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction? Uh, would, do you switch patients to study agents or do, do you presume a class effect? Uh, I presume a class effect. Uh, most of us presume a class effect. Um, having said that, um, Having said that, if we're if I'm starting a patient on my own, uh, I will start them on uh, a drug that has been studied, and that's just sort of uh, my own uh, my own uh, clinical judgment and what I think is probably the most prudent practice uh, personally. Uh, so uh, you know, I, I generally start them on valsartan, uh, makes things a little bit easier as well. If I'm going to end up uh, switching them to uh, an ARNI. Uh, that it's a clean switch as opposed to, um, you know, as opposed to going from one, uh, as, a, as opposed to going from a different compound and switching over to an RNE. So uh, to me, it's usually Velsartan, uh, sometimes Candesartan, um, uh, but uh, overall, um, I do presume a class effect. So if somebody's on uh, Telmisartan, for example, I won't necessarily switch them if they've been on it for years. And um, have um, guideline direct therapies been shown to have cardiovascular benefits in dialysis patients? Yeah, uh, great question. Um, I think when uh, we talk about dialysis patients, uh, they really are a, a different sort of um, uh, a different uh, group of of patients. Uh, certainly, um, there are signals and. Uh, proven benefit of some guideline directed medical therapy in dialysis patients so we still uh, prefer to use beta blockers and ace inhibitors in patients on dialysis 
uh, typically, once they're uh, sub, you know sentenced to dialysis uh, and their potassiums can be well controlled, um, we prefer to put keep them uh, put them back on their ACE inhibitors. Uh, and uh, you know th that's uh, sort of what we use in terms of uh, best practice for um, based on current evidence. Uh, Arnie's uh, I do not use in dialysis patients uh, because of uh, the lack of data. Uh, I think that may change in the upcoming uh, years as more data in uh, end-stage renal disease and CKD patients comes out. Great, thank you. So the last question I received so far is, what is your definition of reduced ejection fraction versus preserved? Um, my definition uh, and what mo is consistent with what most of the studies use uh, as an ejection fraction of less than 40% um, is considered reduced. Uh, between 40 and 50, we kind of uh, is a bit of a no man's land, but we classify it as a mid-range ejection fraction and an ejection fraction over 50%, we classify as preserved ejection fraction. Thank you. So once again, thank you, Dr. Amin, for the great presentation. Um, I'm going to turn the mic now to Gunther. Thanks, everybody. Hi, everybody. My name is Gunther Ha. I'm, I work with David as a co-chair of CSHP for the Golden Horseshoe Grant region, so this area. So during the day, I'm one of the managers for the pharmacy at St. Joseph's Healthcare Hamilton. And today I get the pleasure of introducing our next speaker, Joseph Chin. So for the past 18 years, Joseph Chin has been the clinical pharmacist of cardiology at Scarborough Health Network at the Centenary site. He covers the coronary care unit, three cath labs and cardiac rehab. He is certified in basic and advanced cardiovascular life support and completed certificate courses in cardiovascular nursing one, two, and three. He is also a preceptor for the University of Toronto Faculty of Pharmacy program. Joe received a Bachelor of Science degree in pharmacy from U of T in 1994. He worked first as a staff pharmacist for Sharpers Drug Mart and Pharma Plus from 1994 to 97 and held the position of manager for that department at Pharma Plus at Bayview and Eglinton from 1997 to 2000. He changed from community to hospital practice in 2001 when he worked as a clinical pharmacist at Markham Stillville Hospital in the surgi surgical and emergency department. And he began working at SHN Centenary site in November 2002. And outside of work, Joe is an avid tennis player. He enjoys running, biking, and skiing, and he loves traveling with his family and the ocean and sun. So without further ado, I will pass this on to Joe. Thank you, Gunther. I hope everybody can hear me all right. Uh, I want to thank the organizer for inviting me for this talk. And today I've been asked to talk about the practical part of applying the newer medications or have reputations in terms of uh, a clinical pharmacist perspective. My disclosures are as follow. Um, I just want to talk about the fact that the slides that I, I made up, five cases are that of real cases, and they're the patients I see in CCU, and the slides are that of my own making, and the opinions stated here are that of my own. Uh, Centenary site, you know, is one of three uh, uh, in Scarborough Health Network. We are the cardiac center for the Central East Lynn. Once upon a time, we served the largest, largest geographic area in Ontario uh, for the COSTEMI program. <clears throat> we have uh, six interventionalists. So these are the guys that do angioplasties and uh, COSTEMIs. We do more than 400 COSTEMIs per year and more than 400 elective PCIs uh, uh, on a yearly basis. Uh, in terms of diagnostic cath, uh, we do more than 4,000 a year. We have three electrophysiologists that are specializing in rhythm disorders, and they're also uh, part of the team that implants permanent pacemakers, uh, cardiac resynchronization therapy, as well as implantable cardioverted defibrillators. We also, um, on, on the third lab, cath lab number three, we do pulmonary vein isolation uh, in terms of ablation for patients with history of AFib. 
as well as other type of uh, ablation as well. This is a slide that I, I learned about around 12 years ago. I had the privilege of attending a, a talk among our cardiologists in our group uh, um, with uh, a speaker, uh, Dr. Heather Ross, who's the head of transplant at the time in downtown. Uh, and she presented this for acute decompensated heart failure patients. This is a very simple slide. If you have a patient that come in with acute decompensated heart failure to your emergency department or in your unit, all you have to do is look at the systolic blood pressure and serum creatinine. If the systolic blood pressure is less than or equal to 100, and the renal serum creatinine is uh, more than or equal to 180, the mortality rate for that particular admission is 16%. Intuitively speaking, if you think about this, it makes a lot of sense. When someone comes in with heart failure and it's decompensated, normally your body has a whole bunch of you know, systems going to try to correct that issue in terms of low output and part of it including driving up the blood pressure by increasing the heart rate and so on and so forth. So if you see someone unable to compensate, despite all of those things still have a blood pressure less than 100, it's a bad sign. On top of it, our main state of therapy for someone who comes in with a volume overload uh, with half breath is really you know, diuretic therapy, so IV Lasix mainly. And of course, when you have renal dysfunction, uh, the ability for uh, for the patient to diurese and for the kidney to shed out the fluids is compromised, and hence it ties our hands, and as a result, uh, uh, mortality rate uh, goes up, goes up. So, in terms of the focus of the talk, again, these are real cases. I do, you know, on my own practice on a daily basis, when I see these patients, I always ask myself, is this the right patient? On top of it, I, I I'm going to talk about which drug to use and when, and hopefully that will become clear as the case go on. And I want to talk a little bit about how to titrate according to the lab work, the blood pressure, and the heart rate and the uh, for the vitals. Case one, this is a, a lady CG, a 49-year-old female. Uh, she works with Via Rail, and she's a train attendant. And the way she described her job is that she essentially moves luggages for the, um, you know, for the customers and also serve them uh, coffee, tea, and, and snacks on the train. And she typically serves anywhere between 40 to 50 patients in her section or uh, customers in her section. Uh, in terms of risk factors for her, she smokes marijuana. And the reason why she smokes marijuana is because she has witnessed several uh, suicide by people jumping on, onto the track and it basically you know, gave her PTSD, and this is some, her way of coping. She does smoke it, and which is a, a, a risk factor for heart disease. She also has a family history of a father dying prematurely of an MI in his 40s. Before uh, this admission, she was not on any home medications. And the background is that in late June, early July 2019, she had a flu for about a week. And she said that she felt tired and out of breath since. And the way she described feeling tired at work is that, you know, sometimes she serves 10 patients, 15, sorry, 10 customers, 15 customers, and she'll be totally out of breath and, and exhausted by the end of the, the shift. And that's very unusual for her. She went to see her family doctor two weeks pre-emission and uh, basically described shortness of breath uh, uh, with a cough. She got two courses of antibiotics, amoxo and azithromycin, and she actually described that she felt better initially, but it did not completely resolve the problem. Uh, saw the GP a week before admission. Her shortness of breath was worse. Her ankle swelling was new, and that's gotten worse uh, uh, throughout the, the week. And then so the GP referred to see a cardiologist. It just happens that the cardiologist works in a hospital. A patient went to see the cardiologist in the clinic, not in the hospital, in the cardiologist clinic on the morning of September 11th. Uh, in the office, it did an echo and showed that she had a ejection fraction of 20%, uh, and with severe global hypokinesis of the LV. And uh, the cardiologist at that time picked up the phone and called our MRP or whoever's covering CCU for that week and asked for a direct admission to CCU for CHF management and the patient was admitted that way. 
Of note, the patient got IV Lasix 40 milligrams Q8. Uh, over the next few days, on a daily basis, she averaged uh, um, 1.5 to 2 liters of negative output uh, on a daily basis. Uh, on September 11th, we did an angiogram. The rationale for the angiogram is one, uh, she, uh, she's got the family history. Two, she's a light smoker with marijuana. But more importantly, for, for patients coming in with severe global hyperkinesis with a poor LV, sometimes triple vessel disease, so three vessel ischemia with uh, you know, LAD or left anterior descending circumflex and RCA, if they're severe enough, can cause that. And also uh, what we call left main disease. Left main normally for most people splits into the left anterior descending artery and the circumflex and is responsible for more than 75% of um, blood supply to the left ventricle. And hence, if you have a focal lesion in that area, it can cause the, the or mimic the, the severe global hyperkinesis. So that's why she uh, had the angiogram done. So the result of the angiogram is that she had a CTO or stands for chronic total occlusion of the proximal RCA or the right coronary artery. And that normally does not and would not explain the the severely depressed LV at 20% and also the, the global hypokinesis. And so the, the working diagnosis at that time <clears throat> was viral induced cardiomyopathy. Just to share with people the labs for this patient, the lights were normal, renal function is good. Her LDL is slightly high, hemoglobin is good. Of note, she's a new found diabetic with hemoglobin A1C of 6.7. Her troponin peak is 0 0.074 on our lab, uh, it needs to be above 0 0.05 in order for it to be positive. So she got just tiny increase for trope, her BMP is 16,000. She's got a blood pressure of 150 over 89 and a heart rate of 102. The question that I want to ask the group is, so is this patient a candidate for the new therapy? And I'm not sure why not there's a, a web uh, poll, oh, there is. And maybe just uh, a few seconds, I don't know what the result of the poll is, and then I'll go on with the next slide. The bottom line is this patient is a candidate. Uh, and so what we did on, uh, just going back on, on the admission, on September 12, when she came in, her blood pressure at, on that date was 140, sorry, 100 screens just popped up, 141 over 97. The heart rate was 105 in sinus rhythm. Uh, uh, we uh, gave her uh, basically an entresto uh, dose uh, at um, the, the mid-range uh, twice a day. The reason why I recommend the mid-range, normally I don't, is because you know her systolic blood pressure is in 150s, 140s. She can really handle uh, the mid-dose, mid starting dose. Most of the time we tend to, for me, I usually recommend start the low dose for, uh, for um, the Lasix was continued because she's still shedding fluid and she's still volume overloaded. September 13th, hey, no. sure. yeah. Sorry, uh, we just lost your slides. Um, and then while you pull those up, the, the poll results was 87% said yes. That's great. Can you see my slides now? Not yet. Is that better? I got the feeling the poll actually stopped. It might have not, uh... And I, I got the feeling next time I'm, I'm not going to ask, I'm going to ask the question, but I'm not going to have the poll open. Uh, and people can kind of just do it in their, in their mind, and perhaps this will make the slides better. Uh, I actually don't know how to pull the, the screen back. If you can. Um, is there anything I can do to actually bring it back? Yeah, I'm just going to turn you off as presenter and back on. Sure. Okay, so you should have the ability to share your screen now. Yeah, can you see it now? Yes. Sorry about so that. So you can see it. 
no problem. So that's excellent. Uh, thank you. So I just want to continue. And I, I started off by saying that on September 12, this patient's uh, blood pressure is still on the high side. Heart rate is high and sinus rhythm. I recommended the starting dose of the mid-range in Tresto. Normally, I, I recommend starting with the low dose. But in this case, because of the hypertensive nature of this patient, I recommended the, the middle, middle dose start. Uh, and the, the IV Lasix 40 milligrams uh, QA is continued because of the fact that the patient is still volume overloaded. Uh, of note, take a look at the change after the starting dose of the Tresto over blood pressure. It dropped more than 20 points. My experience is that this is something that happens often with Entresto, um, uh, even with a smaller dose. So really just uh, be, uh, be cognizant of that. If you're the patient, if you're the pharmacist that's recommending this, uh, keep in mind that uh, the blood pressure needs to be monitored very carefully. I have never seen any uh, hep ref, um, uh medications that drop blood pressure uh, more than uh, you know, an RNA. So just keep that in mind. Um, the patient that you reached 2100 the next day felt better. And then of note, uh, at that time, metropolal 12.5 BID was added as suggested carvedilol. But one of the reasons why we went with metropolal is because of the big drop in blood pressure, we felt that carvedilol with the alpha uh, factor in there may lower the blood pressure more than that of metropolal. And so we went conservative and went with uh, metropolal 12.5 PO BID. Although I really don't have an issue with Metoprolol, even we start on it because <clears throat> metoprolol does evidence for heart does have good evidence for heart failure, although the formulation that was used for the Merit HF trial is, is not the, Merit, the, the formulation we use here in Canada. And in on September 14th and 15th, that's a weekend. I wasn't there. On September 16th, I came back and took a look, and the patient's blood pressure at that time was 95 over 70, heart rate of 78. Asymptomatic, she was walking around, she didn't have any kind of uh, symptoms at all in terms of dizziness or uh, daintiness. Uh, of note, over the weekend, cardiologists on call, we switched on Friday, so this is a new cardiologist, switched the metoprolol to carvedilol 12.5 BID, had an MRA and spironolactone 25 daily. The Lasix IV is changed from Q8 to once a day. At that time, on the day of the, the rounding, I actually recommend hey, let's add ivabidine for this patient. And the reason is because her uh, a heart rate is consistently over 75 uh, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the CCU, even over the weekend. And that was accepted, so we went on with it. Uh, the patient was discharged on September 17th. And if you take a look, uh, these are her labs. Uh, potassium is good, kidney function is good. So, um, blood pressure is on the low side, again, asymptomatic, which is good. Um, and she was discharged on, and her heart rate was in the 60s, discharged on aspirin and was superstatin 20 because of the coronary heart disease of the chronic total occlusion of the RCA. And her hep rep medications were a medium dose of the carvedilol, mid dose of the RNA, and spironolactone is good, good dose, uh, low dose of uh, ivabidine. The Lasix is on PO, uh, 40 milligrams on a daily basis. Of note, during the counseling session, I, I told the, the patient that she qualifies for uh, dapaglyphosin because of the HF trial. But I told her that this is something that we did not get a chance to start here because of this relatively short duration. Uh, and I told her that on follow-up, she should have a discussion with the cardiologists in the community and talk about the appropriateness of starting the SGLT2 inhibitor. She's a prime candidate because she's a wealthy young lady, 49, She's more on the big side, a little bit obese. She would probably benefit from this compared to uh, someone who's frail and, and thin. Uh, the one thing I do want to talk about DAPA-HF, that's a little bit confounding, is that uh, you know, in the trial for DAPA-HF, the percentage of patients on ARNI is relatively small, I believe less than 15%. And so you know, they, their biggest you know, bulk of patients is really on ACE or ARG. So for someone who have RNA on board, you know, whether or not, you know, you add DAPA, sure, you, you'll get benefit, but that, that population, keep in mind, in the trial is still relatively small. So in terms of recap, uh, I, I like to recap each case. This is what I call a dream patient, and reasons because, uh, you know, despite the fact that the EF is low, the main thing is that her kidney is good, 
the blood pressure is high. I much prefer someone coming in with hypertension than someone coming in with a blood pressure of 100 with heart failure, uh, just because of my first slide that I, I share with everybody. So she's a dream patient to me. And of note is that a significant blood pressure uh, when starting Arnie, which I discussed already. Case two. Case two is a patient PH, 68-year-old 60, male. He's got a history of permanent pacemaker on March 2018. Uh, and then July 2018 had a bioprosthetic uh, um, a surgical aortic valve replacement done at the downtown hospital. And on March 2019, he unfortunately, he's a very unfortunate gentleman that got uh, diagnosed with lymphoma and went through a course of RCHOP. Uh, September 2019, a routine follow-up with a cardiologist found that he's got quote-unquote cardiomyopathy and presumably it's due to chemo and at that time he was starting on bisoprolol 5 milligram PO daily and that's the only medication that he was on at home. On February 23rd, 2020, the guy came in with emergency, to our emergency department with weakness and dizziness and was found to be in VT. He was shocked times one, uh, brought back to sinus rhythm and then took to CCU for a pending implantation of an implantable cardioverter defibrillator as a um, secondary prevention. Uh, at that time, the EF uh, on echo was 36%. Uh, his JVP is up, yeah, both his feet is edematous. Uh, of note, his troponin is negative times three. Uh, and in 2018, before uh, the surgical aortic valve implantation, he had an angiogram done at that time the coronary arteries are normal, and of such, we did not feel that he needed an angiogram on this emission, and we didn't do it. I, leave, I list all these, you know, five readings of blood pressure here to give people a sense of his BP on emission. Uh, his heart rate is in the 60s. <clears throat> Renal function is okay. Potassium is in normal range. So the plan is this. The plan was after the ICD. We're going to keep them for a day or two to optimize the, the LV protection. And the idea is if you protect the IV, uh, the LV um, uh, down the road, you're going to have less uh, hospital admission, patient longevity goes up. On top of it, there's less chance for the ICD to actually shock the patient. And uh, but that's uh, uh, our hope. And of note, currently in the hospital, <clears throat> Uh, the bisoprolol that the patient was taking was changed to, to metoprolol 12.5 POPID. And the exact reason for that, it's, it's not uh, clear. But to me, it's, it's any, meeny miny, mo. I'm fine with each one at this moment. So I, I didn't say too much at that time. Question here is, is the candidate uh, a candidate for new therapy uh, for hep ref? And again, I don't, I'm afraid of doing the poll because last time I stalled the, the presentation. So I give people maybe like five, 10 seconds to think about this and go back to this slide. What do you think? Do you think this patient is, is a candidate for the new therapy at this moment? And the answer is yes. So we, you know, the, the blood pressure is consistently over 100, sometimes 120, sometimes 110. Uh, the systolic blood pressure I'm talking about. So I recommend that we start with Tresto, uh, it was accepted. MRP started on a low dose of the uh, RNA uh, twice a day. And at that time, we changed the metoprolol to carvelol 3.125 PID just because of uh, carvelol uh, for patients with poor EF. You know, we look at the Copernicus uh, uh, trial, uh, the, the patients with EF is typically lower than that of Merit HF or Cebus. Uh, so I'm fine with that, that change. The blood pressure uh, the next day, no, take a look at that. Right away, it drops below 100. And this is something that, to me, I, I see the big drop on, on a regular basis. Uh, of note, almost always, the patient is asymptomatic. Even in, when they go to sometimes in the 80s, they're systolic, I'm talking about, they're asymptomatic. Um, the patient was uh, discharged on February 27th after the ICD on the low dose of the RNA. And the carvedilol was 3.125 underlined once daily. Uh, and the reason is because the, the systolic blood pressure on that day and, and subsequently continue, continue to be low. 
and the MRP at that time felt like, well, let's just change the one stain. So instead of twice a day, we give some room for the blood pressure. You can argue, you can go with half a tablet of 3.125 BID. That would have been fine as well. But again, I didn't, I wasn't dogmatic about that. Uh, post discharge on March 3rd, I called the patient at home because I, I told him I'm going to put him on this case uh, for, for, for different talks. Because I always like to um, uh, collect interesting cases. And I found, I found that for him, it was an interesting case. So calling him home, his, his blood pressure was, you know, systolic 101, 94, 98, 102. The heart rate is 50s, 60s. Um, again, asymptomatic. He was mobile, moving around. Um, and But he did mention that after the morning, though, sometimes his, his systolic blood pressure, the lowest he recorded was 79. And same patient, just out of, you know, interest, you know, Two days after I called him, I bumped into his wife in the hall, and the wife told me that he's in eMERGE. I said, what's going on? He said that he got shocked uh, six times. So he got admitted eventually from eMERGE to CCU with what we call VT storm, a ventricular tachycardia storm. He got, six, uh, got shocked six times. Every time someone comes in with ICD getting shocked, we always interrogate the ICD. Uh, meaning to see whether or not you know the rhythm is is a shockable rhythm. They shock the patient appropriately, and it was revealed that the patient got shocked uh, six times appropriately, which means the ICD saved his life uh, potentially six times because without it, he probably would have um, continued to develop VT and got worse and potentially uh, die from it. And the BP in, in CCU is listed here again, consistently low. The heart rate is always and the 50s, 60s for this patient. Uh, he was on Valsac, low dose. Carvedilol was uh, 3.125 BID, so increase from the once a day, the BID, after emission. The key here is that we added amiodarone IV. Uh, amiodarone IV is it's the, the, you know, the gold standard for someone coming with BT. And the question here, you don't have to answer in the poll, is what do you do now? Because for this patient, the clinical scenario has clearly changed, and I want to explain why. Initially, he came in with heart failure, um, uh, VT, one shock, brought, brought him back, he got the ICD in, and then our plan is really to focus on the LV protection. Now he comes in with VT storm. The key here, VT storm can kill patients too, even with an ICD. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, we really wanted to control the VT the best we can, and Yordone's on board already. But the other thing that's very important for VT control is beta blockers. And carvedilol, you know, anecdotally among our, you know, uh, electrophysiology group, we really don't feel that carvedilol decreased uh, the, the, the heart rate or controlled the heart rate as well as either metoprolol or bisoprolol. Uh, and so what do you do in this scenario? And just think about that uh, for a few seconds. So this is the first time in you know, I've ever recommended to, for someone that, that have started or switched to Valsartan or Arnie, and I recommended to switch back. Uh, during rounds, I talked to the MRP, I said, you know what, you know, we want beta blocker for this guy, right? And then we just can't just because his blood pressure is so low. Uh, and part two, part two is, is uh, you know, um, his heart rate is also on the borderline level as well. Discussed with the MRP, he said, you know what, let's give it a go. So we agreed to change it to Candesarin 2 milligrams BID. We started with bisoprolol twice a day uh, to kind of stagger so that it gives the blood pressure some room to work with and add a spironolactone 12.5 on a daily basis to protect the LV further. Spironolactone usually doesn't decrease the blood pressure that much. It does have some diuretic effects and augments that of the, the LASIK. So uh, for someone like him, it's, uh, it's an advantage. Two days later, the systolic blood pressure was uh, 104, uh, 107, 118. This is two days later. This makes us a huge difference. And so uh, the patient is discharged home with uh, bisoprolol higher dose now, uh, 2.5 BID with target dose of 10 on a daily basis. So he's already on five daily. Uh, low dose of candesarin, uh, uh, middle dose of, uh, of uh, spironolactone, and the amiodarone is still on the loading phase of so 200 milligrams field BID. Normally, you know, they see the cardiologist for six weeks, and then at that time, they will try to decrease it to once a day. 
So the recap for this case is that this is the first time that in, as an inpatient that I've actually recommended to switch an RNA back to uh, some, uh, you know, either ACE or R uh, for clinical need. And the importance of really having uh, um, some blood pressure left sometimes for other medications, in this case, for medications like amiodarone and beta blocker, uh, both of which can lower the blood pressure. Case three, uh, this is a, a, a patient PT, 66-year-old male, history of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. Uh, this patient had a MUGA done in uh, July 2019 with the EF of 17%. MUGA is the gold standard for, uh, for EF. Um, the, the patient also have a history of hypercholesteremia uh, following the home medications. Uh, Intrestal low dose, Prisoflo 5 daily, Lasix, uh, statin 10. Uh, of interest is that the patient recently injured the right shoulder and went to the GP and got prescribed diclofenac misoprostol 50 or 200 POPID. Started on September 25th for 10 days. The patient actually took it for 10 days. Uh, with the shoulder subsequently gotten a lot better, but, but the patient finished the course. Six days later, the patient came to our emergency department with shortness of breath, enabled to lie flat. Um, uh, the patient had pitting edema of both feet. Checks X-ray suggests that possible CHF, and on admission to CCU, this the blood pressure and the vitals and uh, the kidney function is normal. Of note, the patient's no fever, normal white count, no sputum, so no signs of infectious nature. Uh, the LVEF on echo is 21%. So the question here is: Is this the right patient for the new therapies? And I, I give pay, uh, people a, a couple of seconds to think about this again. And so the answer is yes, this is the right patient. Um, so we, in, in this case, if you take a look at it, the patient was on a low dose uh, uh, valsartan, uh, sacubitril. And so we recommend it because the blood pressure coming in, despite having all these uh, blood pressure medications, uh, uh, the, the patient still maintained a good, uh, relatively decent blood pressure. And so we recommended up the dose, and we did. Uh, the Brasoplot uh, was changed to Carvedilol 25 POBID. Again, really just because of the poor EF and the fact that, you know, um, uh, for a sicker population, Carvedilol probably would, uh, would benefit a little more according to some, some of the clinical trials. Although, if someone stays on the Brasoplot, I'm not going to argue that too much as well. Uh, the Lasix IV 40 milligrams on daily uh, on a BID basis continue. And on day two, the patient shed out uh, 2,100 mils of urine output over the last 24 hours. The patient said slept better, uh, was able to lie relatively flat, breathe better, and the chest X-ray came back repeated was was improved. The blood pressure was 105 over 71. The heart rate is 73. Kidney function slightly jumped, maintained okay. Potassium stays good. We actually added spironolactone for MRA support for hep rep patient, uh, uh, and the Lasix was decreased from IV to PO. Day three, you take a look at the blood pressure. It's 102 over 69. The heart rate was 74. Kidney function jumped slightly again, but still reasonable. And the potassium is uh, more or less within reasonable range. Uh, patient was walking around feeling better. And uh, we discharge the patient with the, the following medication. So really, we uh, maxed out the Carvedilol for this patient. Uh, and the, the Valsartan, we increased the dose, added an MRA. Uh, the Lasix uh, was a PID for two more days and go back to once a day. Uh, the Rusuvastatin, the same as at home, because this patient was hypercholesteremic. Uh, and we did, I did cancel the patient. No more ANSETs. I think the take-home case here is this. We all know. I think every one of us knows that ANSETs are no good to patients with hep rep. But despite that, I see it happen all the time. Patients coming in are outpatients, prescribe these medications, usually due to injuries, joint issues, and they come in with heart failure. So I always tell patients, uh, if they do come and say no more, never again. And this is the, the case in which, you know, out of the bad, I suppose, with a heart failure admission, we took the opportunity to kind of optimize the RNA a little bit, max out the beta blocker, and added MRA, hopefully with those three changes, so will decrease future hospitalization for this patient. 
ACE4. Uh, this is a 87-year-old uh, patient, initial AF. Uh, the patient has a 30-year history of hypertension, had peripheral arterial disease, had an aortic, uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm repair in 2016, was an ex-smoker, I believe, 10 years ago, had a, uh, uh, some GI upset and takes Pantaloc for it. This is the home medication, Nafedipine XL30, Herbisarin 150, Tanolol 25, and uh, uh, the aspirin 81 along with the pantalon. The patient was visiting from Montreal. Uh, she, she was visiting her daughter who lives in Oshawa. And on February 3rd, 2020, the patient came to Lake Ridge Health Oshawa Emergency Department with chest pain with some shortness of breath. And at that time, there's a diagnosis of non STEMI. Now, of note, the troponin peaked at seven, uh, and it did have some CHF. Uh, and the patient was loaded with aspirin, Berlinta, and Fonda 2.5, along with Lasix 80, IV PID, and then transferred to us for an angiogram uh, because of the non standing diagnosis. Uh, of note, the echo from Lake Health Oshawa, the EF is 40%. Uh, the medication on transfer from Lake Health Oshawa was as follows Metropolis 50 BID, uh, Intercode Aspirin 81, Picacolor 90 PO. Uh, BID, Fonda 2.5 once a day, Liptor 80, Herbicide 150, Adela XL is at home, and the Lasix is IV 80 milligrams now. The question here is, is this the right patient? I'll give people a, a few uh, minutes to think about this. I'll go back to this slide so people can take a look. So I just want to say, at this moment, this, this is a tricky situation. The patient is, uh, you know, the EF is 40%. It's ex basically exactly borderline. Uh, and, you know, the key to me is, is this EF because of the non-STEMI or is this the long-standing EF that the patient would have had anyways? And so to, for me, at this moment, I would just leave it and wait for the angiogram to see what the anatomy looks like. And, you know, you'd be surprised if some people come in with non-STEMI and troponin 7. How many, how many of those patients, uh, you know, have diagnosed with triple vessel disease or left main, left main disease, especially if that they're diabetic? And I know this patient is not diabetic, but uh, nonetheless, that's what I would do. In this case, that, that's what we did. We just waited for the, for the angiogram to come back. Um, uh, of note, uh, in CCU, the blood pressure for this patient is 145 over 80. Heart rate is here. Same creatinine is it's on the high side, but the thing is still within normal range. Potassium is good at 4.1. Uh, the patient was cath on February 4th. And take a look at what happened. The culprit was found to be a 90% what we call osteo left main, so right at the opening of the, of the osteum of the, the left main. Again, the left main usually supplies you know, more than 75% of the blood to the whole left ventricle. Uh, but of note, the uh, specific note from the interventionalist is that the patient had normal flow and the patient was pain-free, both of which tells me that this um, uh, lesion has been there for a long time. One, it's heavily calcified, right? It didn't say pl a plaque rupture, didn't say, you know, uh, uh, superimposing clot. And on top of it, you know, it's got normal flow, which means that 75% that the, 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 the left main supplies is still there. So to me, with this angiogram, it does not explain the fact that, you know, the, the non-STEMI is what's causing the LV dysfunction. And so we decided at that time, we decided to take the patient off the table because of the left main disease. We sent the pictures to St. Mike's Hospital for opinion for bypass surgery. Uh, the patient was turned down by the surgical team. Uh, the explanation I was not, you know, I was, was not shared to me. Uh, and the, it was decided that we're going to do a road ablation angioplasty of the left main. The road ablation is, is, is essentially uh, a diamond studded tip drill that actually pulverizes calcium and that allows uh, a better access to the left main uh, and, and makes the implantation of a stent easier. And this was done on February 6th, one drop the bleeding stent to the left main. Uh, we also, on the 7th, post PCI, did another echo and the echo come back at 38%. So really, is essentially the same as the, the 40%. Uh, this is what really uh, let us believe that her uh, LV dysfunction is really because of the long-standing 
hypertension. You know, she's hypertensive for over 30 years. Um, and, and not because of the recent uh, non-STEMI diagnosis. And so she is a candidate for, for, for the new, new therapies. This is a very busy, busy, busy slide, and I apologize for this. But the reason why I did this is because I want to leave a trail on the same slide for people to take a look at the changes in blood pressure according to what we did with medications and also with the date. So February 7th, um, we decided to DC the, the nifedipine. Now, at that time, uh, the MRP decided to increase the herbicide in 300 milligrams once a day. Someone asked, you know, uh, Dr. Min, the question of, you know, do you classify, you know, ARB as a class or not? You know, again, some do, some don't. In this case, you know, when someone comes in with the herbicide, uh, uh, a lot of times, that from what I see, uh, not every cardiologist, but I would say probably more than 50% of them will stay with the herbicide. Uh, the other 50% will change to something that's more so-called evidence-based with trial guidance in terms of like valsartan and candesartan and so on and so forth. But in this case, it would just increase from 150 to 300. Spironolactone was added for this patient. Uh, the blood pressure continued to be high and the, the kidney function is, is jumping slightly. So you got to keep an eye, eye out for that. Over the weekend on 8th and 9th, I wasn't working, but I came back and I took a look at the chart and marked down these blood pressures. Again, the blood pressure maintained to be high. Of note, over the weekend, nobody changed the medications. On the 10th of February, which is a Monday, uh, the patients still have pity and edema. Uh, Lasix is still at 40 milligrams IVQ12. Uh, the, uh, the patient shed around 1,200 mils overnight, over the 24 hours. And uh, in the morning at 9 o'clock, you know, I, would, I, I start work at 7. So I told, I told the, the nurse, you know, hold off the herb, herbicide. Just don't give it in the morning. Just hold it off. And when we do rounds, we decide what to do. Of note, uh, the kidney function actually gotten worse again, 110. Um, uh, potassium is good though, so that tells me the spironolactone is not that big a deal. Blood pressure maintained high, heart rate in good range. And then during rounds, I suggest, suggested an ARNI. The MRP agreed and DC the herbicide. The beauty of having herbicide instead of A's is that you don't have the washout to wait for. And we started the Entresto right away. And then the Entresto morning dose was started. And again, I, because of the high blood pressure, I recommend the mid range. And on the same day, we increased spironolactone 25 daily. And of note, the next day, the patient got repatriated back at 10 o'clock in the morning to Lake Ridge Health, Oshawa. Take a look at the blood pressure. 125 over 65, and this is the lowest blood pressure since the admission. And to me, that is not driven by the spironolactone. That again, is driven by the fact that we started RNA. And for, so for pa patients with hypertension or good blood pressure, uh, starting Arnie is, is a dream. Uh, for someone that is borderline, you know, hypertension in the hundreds and so on and so forth, just be a little more careful uh, when you start them. So the recap here is that, you know, ejection fraction for this patient is likely due to long-standing history of hypertension and less likely due to the, uh, the non-STEMI. And in terms of the rationale, I've explained in detail why that the, the anatomy on the angiogram does not explain that. So I'm going to go through, I still have some time. I go, this is my last case, and I've, I talked about COVID slightly. So case five is a, a, a patient, SG, 37-year-old male. The patient is a smoker, half a pack a day. He's of South Asian descent, and there's no family history of uh, premature heart disease. Um, uh, the patient does not take any home medications, and the patient does not know of any other medical uh, conditions that he has. Uh, the, uh, on the day of the, uh, the admission, the patient had sudden onset chest pain, 9 out of 10, while watching TV. He waited just a few minutes and called 911 because he couldn't take the pain anymore. And on EKG, uh, show ST elevation of the anterior leads, V1 to V4, with reciprocal changes in the inferior leads. And the uh, co-STEMI was activated and the patient came to us. So the primary PCI was done. And the culprit, the cause for the co-STEMI was a proximal left anterior descending artery, which was 100% block. And that's the definition of ST elevation, right? That's when you see a complete blocking of the art, uh, blockage of an artery. And hence, it makes sense, uh, proximal LAD 100%, one drug eluding stent. The patient did have some mild plaque in the mid uh, right corner artery. The left main and the circumflex is normal. There's no plaque that's uh, seen. 
Of note, the troponin peak is 79, the CK peak around 2200. Uh, the patient had some crackles in both lungs uh, uh, and was given uh, Lasix IV 40 milligrams daily. On day two, the ejection fraction is 31%. The blood pressure is 119 over 65. Heart rate is 98. Kidney function is normal. Potassium is good. Uh, the current medications were dual antiplatelet therapy with aspirin and Berlinta, Lipitor and max dose, Coversil 1 milligrams, no beta blocker yet, and the Lasix IV 40 milligrams daily. The question again to the crowd is, is this patient the right patient for uh, the new, new therapy? I give people a few minutes to think about this. A few seconds, sorry. So this is the, the last case, and this is a patient that is not appropriate uh, for, uh, uh, for the new therapy. And the reason is because this patient came in quickly, uh, you know, within minutes of the onset of chest pain, called 911. The EF that's low, Normally, we have this phenomenon for patients post STEMI of what we call stun myocardium. So the myocardium is not scarred, they're not damaged, but they are stunned. And usually, with medical therapy post revascularization, the ejection fraction bounces back usually within the next couple of months to, uh, uh, or so. And that's one of the reasons why, if you follow this patient, the patient will go see the cardiologist normally in the, in the within four to six weeks after the discharge. And then after that, they'll do an echo in the, the office. And a lot of times with these patients, you'll see that the echo will go back to towards normal level. Uh, and, and that's one of the reasons why for these patients, it's good to just treat them like an ACS patient. Don't start them on an RNA and then just, uh, 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 just wait it out and see what happens in a couple of months. The reason why I bring this up is that I've seen, you know, one of our cardiologists that start patients on Entresto in scenarios similar to this. And some of the arguments, you know, I, I, I've spoken to him before and asked the rationale. And sometimes he said that, you know, his gut is not this patient, not this patient, but, the, you know, the patient that he starts these medications, the, the, the newer medications on, is that he feels that the EF is not going to bounce back, whether it be a lay presentation, STEMI, or uh, uh, someone have a mixed picture of uh, cardiomyopathies and so on and so forth. Uh, but in general, with a clear-cut STEMI like this, don't start patients on a new therapy, even if they have EF, that's, that is low, even if they have heart failure symptoms. That's the driving uh, point for this case. And the other uh, uh, you know, driving point is that you know, this this population is is not studied, and that's one of the reasons why there's an ongoing study that's that's going on right now uh, called the Paradise MI study, looking exactly for these patients with acute uh, post MI, 12 hours to seven days to, for enrolling these patients to see whether or not medications like an RNA compared to an ACE inhibitor in the long term would benefit these patients. And until this trial published and come out with a conclusion, I recommend that we stay on the sideline and do not start uh, the newer therapies for, for this particular population. These other slides for the inclusion exclusion criteria for paradise, I'm just gonna skip them uh, in, uh, in the interest of time. So the conclusion you know, for this talk, just short and sweet, is that you know, new hef breath drugs are being used in the Q setting on an ongoing basis. And, uh, you know, we see that on, in, in CCU all the time. Uh, finding the right patient to titrate according to blood pressure, heart rate, and keeping an eye on the kidney function, potassium is a key. And, you know, our knee start can really drop the blood pressure. Again, you know, my experience is that a 20-point drop in systolic blood pressure is not unusual. Uh, so keep an eye out for that and be, be cognizant of that. And always start with the lowest dose unless the patient is hypertensive. And ivabidine can uh, cause a Friday cardia, but the thing is, it does not lower blood pressure, it doesn't affect the legs, and renal function is very easy to start. Uh, uh, that's uh, something that we, uh, it does not really take a lot uh, to do uh, uh, in terms of monitoring with ivabity. Uh, with the SGT, SGLT inhibitors, uh, you know, like dapaglyphosin, I already talked about the point that with DAPA-HF, you know, if we start someone on an RNA, uh, keep in mind that 
you know, these are not sequential trials with DAPA. You know, they did not say that, you know, 70% of patients are on ARNI. Uh, only a, a relatively small patients are uh, populations on ARNI in the DAPA HF trials. Keep that in mind. Uh, the one benefit is that uh, SGLT2s usually don't lower blood pressure that much. It can be used for someone with clearance as low as 30 mLs per minute or, uh, or above and does not have to be used for diabetics to benefit. I think Dr. Ming spoke to that with great effect. Uh, the following few slides, I'm going to talk about COVID patients. Uh, the disclaimer is that I'm no expert in COVID. I mean, I only have one patient in CCU with COVID. But having said that, I was involved in the discussion of the whole COVID uh, uh, virus and how that is going to affect our cardiac program. And I hope to shed some light on that. And I'll talk about some uh, QT prolongation issues with uh, azithromycin and plaquenil and so on and so forth as well. So STEMI patients with COVID. Before COVID started, I mean, we used to keep three TNKs in the whole hospital, one in CCU, one in Emerge Acute, and then one in the pharmacy at the department. And now we've increased it to 20. The reason is really, you know, if you look at uh, ACC and uh, statement, they've said that, you know, if someone comes in with a STEMI, that is COVID positive. And if they're stable, it's reasonable, instead of going to primary PCI and involving the, you know, the lab team, usually four to five members exposed to COVID, perhaps giving fibrinolysis in the, uh, in this case, TNK, um, would be appropriate. And that's one of the reasons why we increase the quota. And uh, I, and, you know, after this is done, I inform basically all our partners in the Central East Lynn to increase the TNK quota uh, accordingly. And I think for other people who are uh, in the hospital practice with uh, cardiac uh, patients coming in the STEMIs, I think they should think about this as well. And the other thing is, you know, if you get the inter interventional team sick, you know, we got six interventionalists. All you need is three of them down, either through quarantine, isolation, or getting sick with COVID. Then the whole program's in jeopardy. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, we, we increase the TNK. Uh, the other thing, too, is it was fully refunded. So even if, when it expires, we don't use it, we get the money back. So there's really not a lot of downside. Uh, so at Centenary, we treat all co-STEMI patients as a presumed COVID until proven otherwise. So which means when someone co comes in, in the uh, cath lab, everybody's uh, gowned up, uh, facial uh, mask, uh, you know, N95, all of that. And when they come to CCU after angioplasty, the, the nursing team, as well as uh, anyone that's involved, including myself, if we go in, we, we you know, we dress appropriately for protection. And this also applies not only for STEMI patients, even for, I had, we had a patient today who uh, had a transesophageal echo. Uh, even that patient had to wait a day and a half until the COVID comes back negative before we did the TE on that patient. And the reason is, again, you don't want to expose the team uh, to, to COVID. In terms of ACE and ARBs, I know there's some controversy online, but this has been, at this moment, uh, almost unanimously, uh, um, uh, concluded that, you know, for someone that comes in with ACE or R, we should continue on it. And the rationale for, or the, the question or the, 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 the worry with ACE and R is that, you know, the COVID cells enter the body using the ACE2 receptor. And both ACE inhibitor and R increases the, the up regulation of uh, the ACE2 uh, receptors. And that potentially can play a role in terms of infectivity. Uh, again, this theoretical has not been proven. Uh, and currently, there's no clinical scientific evidence that this uh, uh, causes infections. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, all the, the European, uh, U.S., as well as Canadian guidelines or the committees have said that when someone comes in with or without COVID uh, on an ACE and R and it's stable, don't change it. Just leave the ACE and R. And these are some of the cardiac conditions that can be manif manifested because of COVID. So COVID on its own can cause elevated troponin. And that's one of the reasons why there's recommendations saying here, you know, someone comes in with COVID only and you don't, there's no chest pain, no symptoms of uh, 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 MI. But don't try to order, you know, a, a BNP or a, a troponin for these patients because both of them can be driven up just by COVID on its own. 
COVID can cause myocarditis and cause my, uh, cardiomyopathy, and it can lead to arrhythmias. And those are, are reported uh, both out of China as well as Italy. Uh, I'm going to talk about hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin slightly. Again, I'm not talking about the efficacy of these medications in the treatment of COVID. But the question has always been, well, what do you do with these things with QT prolongation and torsad risks? Both chloroquine and azithromycin can prolong QT mildly, not significantly, mildly. Uh, but, and, and we know that there's relate relationship between long QT and torsad to point. Uh, although the relationship is imperfect, and there's many risk uh, uh, factors that um, predispose someone to torsa uh, uh, rather than just uh, uh, prolonged QT. This is a risk score called Tis Tisdale risk score uh, that kind of uh, risk stratifies where not a patient is more likely to uh, have torsa. The truth is, you know, again, we have 18 cardiologists. I've never seen one cardiologist use the Tisdale risk score for torsa. Uh, but having said that, it's a, you know something good to to have reference. The more points you have, the higher the risk for for risk for torsad. And the score itself uh, it tells you here that uh, you know low risk is less than or equal to six points, high risk is greater than or equal to eleven points, with a maximum score of twenty one. Again, nobody really uses it, but if you want as a reference, you can take a look at it. ISMP also have a pretty decent um, list. I actually like this list better because it kind of goes to what I do on a practical, uh, practical day, day in and day out basis. Uh, to me, I usually don't worry about QT uh, prolongation, uh, correct the QT until it's greater than 50, 500 milliseconds. But of course, there's other stuff as well. But in terms of high electrolyte disorders, at least they have a range that they look for. Whereas with Tisdale, it, it does not say that. It didn't tell you exactly with the electrolytes, uh, you know what what to what to watch out for. So I do like this uh, uh, this one as well. So this the the last slide for my talk, and I would take any. Uh, I want to thank everybody for their attention. I'll take questions from anybody uh, at this moment. Thank you, Joe. So this is a reminder, everyone, to put your questions into the question box dialog box in your go-to meeting. So we do have a few questions in here, Joe. So um, the first one is, why did the cardiologist change from metoprolol to carvedilol in the first case? Uh, let me bring up the first case. Um, well, the, the, the reason is it's straightforward, right? Metoprolol and carvedilol, again, I, I mentioned MIR-HF. Uh, MIR-HF is the heart failure trial that studied metoprolol CRXL. Uh, this is a U.S. formulation that showed that metoprolol uh, for for patients with HEFREF actually uh, have decreased um, mortality and decreased hospitali hospitalization. Uh, and so you compare that with uh, uh, Copernicus, for example, which studied carvedilol, uh, and it's a more recent trial, and it showed that carvedilol for patients who have um, more of that population compared to Mary HF, by the way, is class three and class four heart failure, New York, New York Heart Association. And so it's a sicker population uh, with lower EF. And if you look at case one, that patient uh, fits that criteria. And that's, to me, uh, I, I think it's, it's, um, it's, it's a good idea. And that's one of the reasons why they switch. Take a look at this patient, the EF is 20%. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, the, the patient clearly have, have a severe heart failure when they came in. And so uh, carvedilol compared to metoprolol in general, uh, I think for most of our cardiologists would be the way to go for this patient. Uh, and that's, that's the reason. And on top of that, we don't have that formulation that the U.S. have. Uh, I'm not saying that you cannot use metoprolol. You could, especially for someone who's very sensitive, very low blood pressure. You know, systolic in the borderline around hundreds, low, you know, high 90s. Metropolol is more uh, uh, titratable. We can even give, you know, uh, small doses in oral liquid form, uh, whereas uh, uh, carvedilol, with the, the alpha component of uh, carvedilol, it can lower the blood pressure even more. So uh, it's, it's a case to case judgment. 
but for this patient, I think it's appropriate. Thanks. The next question is, once you start adding in Tresto and Spiro and Lasix, and you're monitoring creatinine, and you see it jump drastically, what do you do? Yeah, so that, that's a good question. Uh, it's, it's interesting, uh, you know, there are papers that look at, for example, the use of Lasix, and it's been shown, and this, you know, everybody that work in CCU, ICU, you see this, when you use IV Lasix, the kidney, sim grinding can jump. But numerous papers have, sh have shown that that jump in CM grinding uh, normally will normalize down the road. It's not something that's permanent. That's number one. Number two, you know, someone that comes in, you start them on an ARNI. And you, you would look at the patient the same way as someone that you would start an ACE inhibitor or an ARP, right? So if someone, you know, have a, a borderline serum grinding, uh, and and it's increasing. I always look at the patient and say, what is the baseline for that patient? So if the patient comes in with chronic kidney disease with a baseline of 160, then I got to be very careful. That doesn't mean you cannot use them. That just means I got to use with care. But m these patients that I talked about, basically most of them comes in with normal uh, renal function. And normal renal function patients coming in with heart failure, a lot of times the increase in symptoms is caused by low perfusion to the kidneys and the use of Lasix rather than, uh, you know, due to ACE and ARP uh, involvement. And that's one of the reasons why you have to keep an eye out for it, be cognizant of it. But for me, I always look back at the baseline. And um, as long as the trend is not jumping up a huge amount, uh, monitor the baseline. Uh, keep, an, keep an eye out for the baseline. That's what guides my, my judgment. Thanks. The next question is, do you often recommend Evaverdine in patients despite not being optimized on their beta blocker dose? Uh, yes. The, the, the truth is this. I probably recommended uh, Evaverdine use in CCU uh, probably the last six months, maybe four times. So it is, it's not something that you use that often. Uh, part of the reason it's got, is that a lot of patients coming with heart failure have a have background of atrial fibrillation. Uh, and, and of course, that's a, you know, a exclusion criteria for the use of ivabidine. Uh, and the use of ivabidine does not, you know, in, in, the, in the, the trials that actually we have and the trial data that we have, it actually does not uh, decrease the ability for a clinician to up titrate beta blocker. It may be counterintuitive, and that is you use Ivabidine, it drops the heart rate. But now, if it goes bratty, then you have more of an issue of up titrating a beta blocker. But of the small limited data that we have for patients using Ivabidine inpatient, uh, is that actually the use of Ivabidine led to an improvement of LVEF, and that in itself actually increased the cardiac output for the patient, presumably, and that allows the blood pressure to be a little bit more uh, on the higher side, and that actually allowed up titration of beta blocker. So the studies we have, limited studies, small ones, not conclusive, actually show that the use of irabidine for inpatients not only did not decrease the, the ability for us to up titrate beta blockers, in, in fact, that actually led to uh, um, an increased ability to up titrate beta blockers. Thanks. Have you used the MRA or an ARNI for CHF with reduced ejection fraction in a patient with creatinine clearance less than 30 mils a minute? I would say no. Uh, again, you see, you know, for hospital pharmacists, I always say this, uh, you know, the 30 mils per minute uh, thing, you, you got to look at, is that 30 mils per minute now? Or is that 30 mils per minute when the patient was at home before they come in? So the baseline, again, is very important. But the straight answer to that is no. If someone comes in with, you know, uh, 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 EF of less than 30, would be very careful about MRA 
would be very careful about ACE R uh, as well as an RNA. But having said that, if the patient comes in and we have history of this patient having chronic kidney disease with an EF, uh, sorry, with a clearance of consistently hovering around 30 mils per min, for example, and you look at the potassium level, the potassium is in a good, good range. I don't see why you cannot add spironolactone and uh, and a and an RNA for this patient with with a lot of monitoring, with a lot more care. But uh, you know, the key to to it is uh, I still look at the baseline and the trend. Thank you. So the next question is, how quickly do you up titrate the entresto when you start at a low dose? What are the parameters? Yeah, so actually, if you take a look at the, uh, you know, the, 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 some of the trial data for uh, entresto, there's actually uh, slides, I actually have the slides in my slide deck in other talks, but I don't have it with this one. Uh, and they would actually, in general, look at the, the blood pressure so if you start with a low dose in Tresto, you monitor it. They normally monitor it for a day or two uh, or longer as an outpatient, preferably as an outpatient. For inpatient, uh, it, it's harder because, you know, in general, for someone to start with in Tresto for low dose, I don't see myself increasing the dose to the mid-range and the high, high range that often, uh, unless the patient's hypertensive. Uh, but uh, most of the time, I would not consider increasing unless the systolic blood pressure is consistently over 100. And so if I start with low dose, I have one or two days of, you know, six, seven numbers, systolic blood pressure is consistently over 100, patients tolerating it, asymptomatic, then I'll consider increasing the dose. Um, and if, if people want, I can actually send a slide for how to up titrate these patients in the clinical trial setting. Um, but again, those trial settings are done uh, over a span of about a week. Uh, so, you know, they're not monitoring every day and up titrating every day. They're monitoring for a few days a week, and then if they're stable, they're up titrating. Thanks. Given carvedilol has alpha effects, it's a more low BP lowering effect, would desoprolol be a better choice since it's more selective and maybe can still keep the RNA versus switch to an ARP? Yeah, so, uh, you know, to me, bisoprolol and carvedilol is eeny, meeny, mighty, mo. Um, I don't pick on, on which one. And the truth is a lot of uh, the cardiologists, you know, may prefer bisoprolol. But having said that, a majority of our cardiologists, in, in my experience, is that for someone who comes in with poor EF, heart failure, they tend to go towards more carvedilol if the blood pressure tolerates. Uh, uh, and if, if not, uh, then we go with lower dose of carvedilol or maybe even lower dose of metropolol. Uh, in terms of the bisoprolol, if someone wants to use bisoprolol for someone with low EF, heart failure, I think that's fine. Uh, you know, so I'm not going to, uh, in general, I won't recommend a change unless I feel like there's an absolute good reason. And to me, uh, bisoprolol have good clinical trial backing and same with carvedilol. But the one argument that you, you may have is that in Canada, carvedilol is, you know, the, the only beta blocker approved for, for hef ref And, I'm, I, I, you know, you don't get that with metropolol and bisoprolol as far as I know. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, the next question is, based on the cases you presented, it seems like patients are often started on Entresto before they are started or optimized on traditional therapy. Is this a common practice at your institution? No, no, I don't think so. Um, I, I wouldn't say it's a common practice. But the mm -hmm. thing is, you see, a lot of the patients that I picked here, four out of the five were patients that are de novo heart failure patients. And most of them are not even, you know, over 50% of those, those patients are not even on home medications. And, and if they are on home medications, they're only on, you know, one, one home medications, for example, case two on so far, five milligrams on a daily basis. So, you know, when we start, we, you know, we don't necessarily start with an RNA. Uh, we can start with an RNA with a beta blocker, especially if there's a need for it. For example, someone with arrhythmias, 
whether it be AFib, for example, BT, for example, history of VF, BT shocks, uh, those ones I would aim towards more of a, a beta blocker start rather than an RNA start. Uh, and if someone comes in on an ACE and ARP, BP tolerates, comes in with heart failure, a mission with heart failure, with reduced ejection fraction, and switching the ASA ARC to RNE would be appropriate. I think the cases that I presented, you know, uh, we started on the, uh, on, on the RNE for some of those patients is because of the fact that they're de novo and also, um, uh, you know, they, they weren't on, on a lot of medications at home. And the clinical criteria uh, uh, kind of justifies it in the sense that two of those patients were hypertensive and we feel like getting the blood pressure under control uh, would be of value. And uh, again, uh, Arnie will, will drop it more than the beta block. Thanks. The next question is, what's the time frame in which you'd expect to see creatinine to normalize after the jump in value uh, from starting the Arnie? Yeah, so, uh, you know, out of, you know, all the patients that, that I've, I've listed so far, I think there's only one patient that had a jumping of the, the, the serum cranium. I, I'm not sure what that's caused by. It could be the heart failure. It could be the medications. Um, but, you know, I don't know exactly. You know, I haven't seen enough patients to know that, yeah, it takes three days for it to drop, four days for it to drop. Um, and, and, you know, if someone comes in with chronic or acute or chronic uh, uh, kidney dysfunction, most of the time we won't even start them on ACE, ARP, or RNA. We just hold off until it kind of drops before we start. Uh, so thankfully, my experience has been that with uh, the, the, the newer therapies, I haven't had uh, an experience with starting a patient on a newer therapy, and the next thing you know, their CM grinding jumped by 25% or 40%. Uh, I haven't seen that. But exactly how many days does it take for it to drop back to normal? Uh, I'm not sure. Thanks. And the last question before we close uh, in the time is uh, the last one is to clarify if ravidine can be used in decompensated heart failure? That's a question. Yes, ivervidine can be used for decompensated um, heart failure. In fact, you know, some of the um, so-called experts in the field, guys like Jonathan Howlett, um, some of the St. Mike's docs downtown, and uh, Toronto doc down, Toronto General doc downtown, have anecdotally used ivabidine uh, for patients, you know, almost immediately after uh, inotropic support. So the moment they wean them off inotropes, and Jonathan Howlett have even had patients that are on inotropes, and uh, same with Dr. Gordon Moe, if he use it uh, once or twice, according to his talk to, to our group um, uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, even on patients with inotropic, uh, needing in the inotropes, uh, to put ivabidine on at that time for patients with sinus rhythm and higher heart rates. Uh, so to me, I'm comfortable with starting ivabidine not necessarily at the point when they're on inotropes, but when they're off inotropic support uh, and they're stabilized and, and they're in sinus rhythm, heart rate is high, their blood pressure is borderline, does not, to does not you know, tolerate kind of uh, starting other medications, uh, you can consider a low dose irabidine for those patients with uh, half breath. Great, thank you. So thanks again, everybody. Thanks, Joe uh, and Dr. Ammon for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us. And we appreciate everyone being here, utilizing this digital medium in this unique time. It's a little bit of a different way to do a CE, uh, but it uh, seems to be more common nowadays. Hopefully you found the webinar useful. And to let you know, the slides will be posted very soon, probably tomorrow, available on the Ontario branch CSHP website within a week. And those, uh, don't worry if you're not a member, anyone that was on the webinar tonight will get a direct link that you can access the webinar. We're also going to be sending out a 
survey uh, to you to see what you guys thought. So we can do make some improvements moving forward, to, uh, see what you liked, what you didn't like, and what we can do to make any changes to improve the process. And again, we have to thank our event sponsor, Novartis, and our presenters again for taking the time out of their busy days and uh, sponsoring this, uh, this event. Thank you, everybody, and have a good night. Thank you, Kandar, David. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, guys. That was great. Exhausted. <clears throat> Nine o'clock. Clock is rolling. Out of my ears. Oh. Keep going.